All right, guys, welcome to the Fish North Georgia podcast. We are back by popular demand. You guys asked for it, and we're bringing it back. Today, we're going to sit down with our very own Ryan Sheffield. We're going to talk about the next three months on Lake Lanier and how he approaches it with his own style, power fishing. We appreciate you guys tuning in, and let's get started. What's going on, man? What's happening? You ready to talk Lake Lanier? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is how you approach lake lanier correct you're aware of the highway is what you like to say exactly all right so let's kind of let's kind of give everybody a little bit of background information on you and your experience with lake lanier so what's your earliest memories of fishing lanier probably around maybe age 16 i would probably say um 15 or 16 and uh, me and a couple of my buddies you know one of my buddies in particular he had a uh, 1976 uh samaroon mm-hmm. it was like 16 foot had a little 55 horse mercury on it and uh you know we didn't know anything we just knew there was a lake and right. we lived 15 minutes from it you know so you know our destination was always lumpen county park okay and that's uh, the north end. that's way north you know that's way up chesty right um there's people that are scared to go that far up you know um but uh we would put that boat in there and we would fish and we didn't know no better. We would just fish. Right. And we caught fish. And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, we decided one day to brave the waters, and we went and put it in at Toto Creek one day. Going a little farther south. A little Not farther much, south. but a little farther. And we were just awestruck at like, whoa, like, this is totally different than being up where we were right. before. And uh, we went to the back of this very, very back of this pocket. It was the very first time we went down there in Toto. And he caught one on a super fluke, a spot that was nearly four pounds. And we had never seen a spotted bass that big before. Right. And then all of a sudden it was like the wheels started turning and we were like, oh my God, let's go down farther south. Uh-huh. And then as time went on, you know, we kept creeping farther and farther and farther south. Right. And uh, just, you know, then the love and the like got to have it started happening. You know, by the time I got out of high school, it was like, that was like all I wanted to do was, you know, I wanted to fish on Lake Lanier. I wanted to fish from one end of the lake to the other and you know just it was just really a, just a special little time in my life i guess when i was young and dumb and didn't know no better right <laughs> so we all go through that period we we do we yeah. do we really do i think everyone can probably say that they do um so you know as time went on just like i said uh i hadn't really fished any tournaments or anything um had fished some little bitty john boat tournaments on good old-fashioned Yahula, like Zwarner and Dahlonega. Which is, yeah, in Dahlonega, Georgia. Yeah, because, I mean, we had a, we all had John boats and stuff in high school with little bitty, you know, two batteries and uh, a trolling motor. Trolling motor, right. You know, yeah, I mean, that was all we had. Right. But, uh, but we, we we would fish Yahula in its glory days. And, uh, you know, we didn't know no better. We just thought we were, you know, we, we thought we were something else and stuff and – it just one thing led to another. Next thing I know, I get the opportunity to fish a tournament at like 19 on Lanier, and uh, it, that was that was really that was a really bad situation, right? Because the very first tournament I ever fished, we won. <laughs> So, <laughs> like somebody kind of like the kid that goes hunting shoots yes. the 13 point the first time he goes hunting. He's yeah, that's for life. a very good equivalent of that, right? Yeah. And uh, it was in September. Uh, there was a weekend on my birthday, and um, we uh, we caught all our fish on a buzz bait. Okay. So, you know, it was this perfect storm of, you know, throwing a buzz bait. There's nothing funner than throwing a buzz bait. Right. And then also to go to boot, we had like 15 and a half pound of spots. You know, so we were catching some, some good fish. Right. And then we ended up winning the tournament. So then it was like, huh. And a light bulb went off my brain. I was like, hey, hey this is pretty fun. That's I was right, like, Mike yeah. can make a little, Mike can make a few few dollars on this every now and again. <laughs> and then since then, it's just, it hasn't slowed down. It's right. sped up even faster. Yeah. So, so that, that started it all. But going from a 100 acre reservoir to a, I don't even know how how big Lanier is. It's about, I guess, my, my numbers may be wrong, but I think it's about 29,000 acre impoundment. It's so, pretty big. Yeah, it's pretty big. Kind of, for somebody that's listening that might not be familiar with Lake Lanier, kind of describe it. Because, you know, we started off this conversation by saying 
Lumpkin County Park, which is on the very north end of Lake Lanier. Yeah. And that's a totally different if you're yeah. down yeah. the south. But kind of kind of give everybody just an overall feel of what Lake Lanier is. In my opinion, Lanier is three different lakes mixed into one. Mm-hmm. That is just my opinion of it. Um, you've got – because the Chattahoochee side fishes different than the Chesapeake side. And then they and those go. Those are the two major. Those are the two major feeds yeah. for Lake Lanier that that created Lake Lanier back in the whenever it was uh, yeah. the 40s, 50s, 60s. Whenever, like, yeah, yeah, just yeah. long, long time long before time I was born. Right. <laughs> exactly. know, so, but those are the two major rivers that fed all the water uh, to make Lake Lanier when they dammed it up. Um, but it does fish. I, I, it's three different lakes in one. Um, like I said, you got you got the Chattahoochee. Um, it fishes a little bit different than the Chesity, uh, where the Chesity and the Chattahoochee uh, converge mm-hmm. in the Mid Lake area at the Chesity Bay. Uh, it's kind of uh, a little bit of a cross between those two fish, between those two arms, and then everything below, about basically 369 down, is what I say is a totally another end of the lake. Right. It, they all fish. They they all have tendencies that fish the same but as far as the way fish set up they they can be different mm-hmm. at certain times of the year so so you can kind of break it down as the the river arms mm-hmm. as the upper third of the lake yes the, the mid lake chest sea bay mm-hmm. where they converge and then yeah south of what people know as 369 basically that's when the big water starts mm-hmm. that's some big that, water that's, that's the big water that's lower end that's mm-hmm. what i've always called lower end the lower end everybody talks about that now would you consider it a Highland Reservoir, Clearwater Reservoir? Yeah, it is, but it's. Uh, I would probably really more consider a lake like Burton to be more of a Highland Reservoir than Lanier. Okay. Um, I get some arguments with that, but uh, it's just there's the way Lanier fishes from January through December. It it does it has a lot of Highland Reservoir tendencies, but then there's also some traditional tendencies and that can be found in the lake. Right, and Lanier started off as a largemouth fishery. Mm, yeah, it did. And so it has progressed into what is basically the spotted bass destination of the Southeast United States for a lot of people. Potentially the United States. Yeah. Yeah. You might have one or two out in California out there that might argue with it, but Lanier is it's got to be top five, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it definitely. And so what is it? So we're going to concentrate on both species of fish, but because mm-hmm. um, you have to fish for both of them, you have to fish for both of them. Yes, but it's known right now, currently, mm-hmm. and we're January 2022 as a spotted bass lake. Yes. All right. What makes it a great spotted bass lake? The population of the spots that's in the lake, and then the blueback herring. The blueback herring. What do blueback herring do to uh, a lake? Uh, as far as fish growth and stuff, what does it do? It's like rolling it's like you got a bunch of spotted bass rolling up the golden corral to all you can eat buffet it's all you can eat yeah the, the the forage of lake lanier is just it's amazing at what different food sources they have to right. pick from um but the bluebacks tend to reign supreme right um now certain times of year you know the, the shad will rain will kind of reign supreme over the bluebacks but no matter what the bluebacks are always kind of the, that's, por- the that's porterhouse steak right, of the lake, right. basically. That's that's the game changer of yeah, the blueback's in that. Yeah. So, um, and there's a lot of different discussions on on if blueback's are good for a lake or or not, and that's that's for a different episode. But we know that if you see pictures of spots coming out of Lake Lanier, mm-hmm. just kind of describe for somebody what a, a healthy spotted bass looks like. A healthy spotted bass is. I'm not going to really put a measure on the length, but they all have guts. Yeah. I mean, they're fat. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they've been eating. I mean, there's like, you know, there's no doubt, you know, I, it, I've took people out fishing on the lake, you know, on little trips and stuff like that, that haven't, don't really get to fish linear a whole lot. And they're amazed at, you know, how big just a 14, 15 inch long spot is, you know, they're like, man, dude, dude this thing's like, I mean, like, what do you think it is? Pound and a half. I said, it's, closer to two than you realize right you know and and that's just a little bit different than other lakes um around here 
Um, and, and there are a few anomalies, um, but for the most part, the size of the fish and the rate that they grow in Lanier is just so much faster. Because hey. spotted bass only live to be about 8 to 10 years old anyway. Right. But you never see a picture of a spot out of Lanier that doesn't have a gut. Very rarely. Yeah, they're all healthy. Yeah, they, they are all healthy. Familiar with that. So what we're gonna what we're gonna really chime in on today, and I'm gonna get your thoughts on this, is we're gonna talk about basically how you're gonna approach Lake Lanier, mm-hmm. kind of for the next three four months. So we're gonna go mm-hmm. like spring and maybe early summer. We might get into that, but mm-hmm. for the most part, right now we're in January, and so we kind of broke it down into, um, I guess, three main areas: the pre spawn. The spawn and the post spawn. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so right now we're in like the pre pre spawn. Yeah, kind of that's what that. I call it. I call it so, the pre pre spawn. Um, how do you approach right now the pre pre spawn on Lake Lanier? Again, we're mid January right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, the the really the spawn isn't as it'll be here before we know it. Right. Um, you know, we're just a couple months removed here from away. Should I say from seeing bass on bed Mm -hmm. um catching bass off bed um and to me because of what happens in lanier there is a wintertime pattern yes um but that wintertime pattern um it only lasts for about a month to a month and a half depending upon how cold it is like right now specifically the, the it's we're middle january middle end of january and the water temperature is still in 48 right. it's just still not that it's still not cold um what's normal for this time of year normal for this time of year we're looking in the low 40s okay so we're this year we're a little bit warmer we're warmer and uh it, it you know that's a whole different discussion for another day right on what that is way that has impacted the lake because we've had the past couple of winters have all been eerily similar Mm -hmm. um in terms of we just haven't had this massive long week weeks of sheer cold right and it just hasn't it just hasn't got cold enough to just to and stayed cold enough to really impact the fishing to really put them in this winter time stage what would they normally do say on a normal year when the water temp gets real low so normally like so if it was a normal time this time of year everything's going to be for the majority of your time 25 to 40 feet deep okay um that's where your that's where your general consensus of population of fish is going to be found throughout the lake Right. Uh, that doesn't matter. Chesapeake, Chattahoochee, Mid Lake, South End. It doesn't matter. Uh, you will find a lot in that twenty-five to forty foot range. Now we're gonna talk. We're talking largemouth and spots. We're or? talking both. Both. Okay. Yeah, we're talking both. There are a population of shallow fish on Lanier that live shallow and stay shallow year round. But as far as for you know, some person uh, listening to this right now that was that says I'm going to go to Lanier. Uh, and go fish uh, this coming up weekend. Um, you're not really, unless you really know where you're looking and know what to, what to do. You're not going to want to go target the shallow fish right now because uh, you'll find the deeper fish. When you find the deeper fish, you'll it's a it's a slugfest when right. you find them because I mean it's it's almost how many can I catch? Right. So the more consistent pattern yes. is deeper. Right now. Yes, it is. And on a normal year. Even yeah. right now and on a normal yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there are a, there are a good bit of fish who are still um treating it like it's colder that are out there all already. They've been out there deeper since the end of November, first of December. Um they those fish I think those fish just live deep all their life they don't ever really right they don't ever really come up shallow what whatsoever um but there is some populations of those um but i don't really like to target those fish out there in 40 50 feet of water um my my main thing is now is 40 feet up all the way up to inches of water okay um that's kind of where i like to stay right um so what are we targeting right now? Are we targeting ditches, points. Yeah, so right now it's really a, it's really kind of right now it's kind of a two man game in terms of uh, the lake. Uh, if you're not ditch fishing, uh, you need to be fishing, you know, deep 
steep points. Okay. Uh, rocky steep points. Right. Um, those right now are your two different concentrations of fish are found from one end of the lake to the other. And the one key factor with all that, with both of those different fish, where they're set up is bait. Okay. Bait is the number one factor. Um, for their setup. Well, let, let's take the ditch because, you know, you, you just described two different things. Mm-hmm. First of all, let's describe to someone exactly what a ditch is and what you're looking for in a ditch that you think will hold bait and fish. Okay, so to me, a ditch is any creek that's in that's on the lake from one end to the other to the end. Um, now, we're talking always flowing creeks or just even runoffs or no, stuff like that it's 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 just creeks that go into you know they can have runoff um they can have a creek flown into the back of them whatsoever or they just don't have any of that but uh, they all have their own certain characteristics and their certain tendencies that make them good mm-hmm. i say we're going to say ditches right as was going was what we'll say um because um, the ditch by the the term ditch bite is like this generic thing. And I think the term ditch bite is kind of uh, meant to, and I'm going to say this, and I know people will argue, me, argue with me about this, but it's uh, it's a term to throw people off. Because it seems, because a lot of people that have that, that I have actually got to, to speak to, they're like, well, what is a ditch? Mm-hmm. Well, well, you know, and they, they, they give me an idea of what their idea of what a ditch is. And I'm like, well, yeah, that is a ditch, but that's not just what you want to look for. Right. Um, really and truly, like, I guess the term of what I would say is it's, it's, it's the back of a creek bike. Um, you know, you've got the stage um, that starts, you know, end of November, middle of November, all the way through about February, um, where up, up shallow first thing in the morning in the very backs of these ditches and the backs of these creeks, they're actively feeding on the bait. Uh, you can physically see them feeding. You don't need electronics. Uh, no amount of electronics is needed to so see these they fish. They push the bait up. In, and we're, we're talking like fingers and kind of yes. arms kind of back in off the yeah, lake. Okay. Yeah, yeah, So you, you pull into these, you pull into one if you just pick one. And you pull into one and you're using your, your graph at your console whatsoever. And you pull into one and you're going to see, you know, the creek channel. Well, the creek channel is your ditch. Okay. As you go up through there, as you go all the way from wherever you see the creek channel on the graph, on your topo- on your topography, you're going to go follow it all the way up to the back. Um, the, the main things, the main key points to pay attention to with any of these creeks and any of these ditches is any kind of breakage. So if you have, say, your creeks coming down through here and, you know, you've got, as it's going up through here and it makes a turn and it comes back up this way going toward the back, well, this turn right here will be a spot where they will congregate first thing in the morning. So if somebody's kind of picturing in their mind, like looking down on the creek, it's almost like almost like makes a little bend mm-hmm. in the original channel. Yes, in, in the, the original re- channel. So any bend whatsoever in the mm-hmm. original creek channel is what you're talking about right now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of times what happens is with these little spots is you've got this spot that you know butts in like what we're just like what you just said, um, and the spots will sit up on top of it, and they basically sit down on the bottom, real 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 close to the bottom first thing in the morning. And they wait basically for the bluebacks to make a wrong move. And when the bluebacks make a wrong move and they get too close to that little spot that breaks in on that creek channel, they go hog wild. They'll they'll push that bait, they'll push it all up to the surface to feed on it. And then you'll that's when you'll see them busting. Um, Lanier is one of those lakes where the top water bite never really dies. Right. No matter what time of year it is. Yeah, we've heard that recently. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're still able to catch right now if you find them that will that will eat the bait. You can still catch some topwater fish. Okay. Um, on an actual traditional topwater bait. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one thing. One of the reasons that makes this kind of fishing this time of year so special. Uh, pertaining to any of these other blueback lakes. Uh, you know, and we're also talking like Hartwell. Clark's Hill, mm-hmm. um, they all have bluebacks in them, um, and you can pretty much take this style of fishing and transfer it to any of those lakes too. Um, 
in my opinion, the fishing never really gets bad on Lanier, no matter what time of year it is. Right. I know some people say, oh, when it gets hot summer, you know, and those fish still eat. Mm-hmm. They don't just not eat in the summer because it's hot. Right. Um, there are certain periods of the day with, with going into the way that I like to fish. There's still certain periods of the day that if you run enough of those spots like that during any given day, you're still going to get those fish to act like they ain't never seen a bait before. And they're going to go crazy. And those fish are easier to catch. Um, top water fishing is, you know, it's not only is it the most exciting fishing, but it's also uh, visually satisfying right, to see absolutely. that. Um, but then also, too, you know, there's not a whole lot of, uh, there's not a whole lot of skill that has to go into it. Um, there is a level of skill that comes with top water fishing, but when you find fish that are actively feeding, um, there's really no rules as to what you do mm-hmm. um, in terms of like a top water bait. Right. Um, if you can get them attracted to the bait to come eat the bait, then you're doing something right. Yeah. Um, so, and so this is happening like right now in the back of the ditches. Yes. Early in the morning or all early in the morning. And there are some instances where it will stay happening. Um, particular if you have an overcast day, if you have an overcast day, the herring don't have any reason to leave that to leave that creek. They don't have any reason to leave and go back out there to the timber line and suspend above that timber. Well, the fish basically right now they set up. They know when it's coming. Mother Nature is a beautiful thing. Right, it absolutely. really is. It's absolutely wonderful thing. Um, and these fish set up early in the morning. They're like it's almost like. Uh, it's almost like a line of people sitting in a Krispy Kreme waiting on the hot light to kick on. Right. And as soon as that hot light kicks on, it's like this. And it's like this on Lanier when, in terms of the bluebacks, um, when the hot light kicks on, those fish say, mm, "Time to go get them," and they basically wait for that hot light to kick on. And the hot light, in turn, for the herring is that the herring make a wrong move and the fish go eat them. And they chase them, and they chase them, and they eat them, and they eat them, right. and they eat them. And then if the herring leave and go back out to the timber, well, then a good bit of the population of the fish will leave too and go out there. Now, where they set up all kind of depends upon their mood that particular day. Some of them will set up in the timber. Some of them will set out right in front of the timber. Some of them will set up on the sides of these creeks. It all just kind of depends upon the different mood, but we could probably talk about that for, for hours. Right. Yeah. Well, and we <laughs> so, could. But you're you're kind of a um, self-described power fisherman. Yeah. So how are? Let's just say you roll up into a creek first thing in the morning. What are you throwing to approach those fish that you think are actively feeding in the back of a creek? So I've pretty much got uh, for the first two hours, basically in the morning, um, I have a uh, a true grit tackle ditch digger on with a Kai Tech. Um, I have underspin. Mm-hmm. Um, my personal favorite is the uh, the uh, Sugar Hill Bait Company underspin sweet spin, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, a Alabama. Very, a very good product. It is a very good. Yeah, the, the ba- that bait does not roll. Right. Um, no matter how fast you uh, reel it. Um, but a ditch digger, an underspin, an Alabama rig, a jerk bait that dies to at least 10 feet deep. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, um, depending upon kind of what I found during that particular week before either a shaky head or a jig. Okay. So like with the ditch digger, you're targeting the ones that are sitting on the bottom. Mm Mm-hmm. With the underspin, you're coming up a little bit. No, I still throw the underspin the same way. Okay, so you're still on the the bottom. Yeah. And then you use your jerk bait and stuff like that for Mm -hmm. mid-level. So you're covering all the water column. Yes. And that's what you have to do to to be successful to to quote-unquote ditch fish. You have to be able to cover from top to bottom. Right. Okay. Um, So when I – and one other thing, too, we just talked about is I'll have some kind of a top water lane on the deck, too. Just in case you just see in case I see him actively feeding, actively yeah, exactly. Feeding. And if you're going to throw a top water at this time, what's your favorite? I've had a lot of success with uh, popper this time of year because I don't have to work it as fast, mm-hmm. and also I can control the pop. Because some days you might need to pop it pretty aggressively, and some days you just need to barely get that thing to go on just where it's making a little bloop. That's it. 
for anybody listening, any specific colors or something you might can throw at them? I stick with bone okay. just because it emulates bait fish so easy. Okay. I don't get stuck up on top water colors too much. Um, you know, I, I, no matter what time of year it is, bone, chrome, and then any kind of herring color. Okay. And after that, I really don't, I don't try to get too more, much more fancy with it. How long will this ditch bite last? So this ditch bite it will well, normally, normally, yeah. normally. Well, normally, and it'll probably be the same way this year, unless you know God proves us wrong and He decides, nope, we're going to go into a deep freeze. Um, typically, until about middle of February, okay, roughly. Right. And the key with that is, is around the middle to the middle end of February. The days kind of start getting a little bit longer as we start creeping up to the to spring. Okay, um, you know everyone knows you know as this as you know the Earth is constantly rotating, and the Earth is also on its tilt on its axis. Well, right now we're tilted away from the sun where we are, but as we get into February, toward the end of February, the Earth starts to rotate back. Well, those days start getting longer, mm -hmm. and typically what I do is I pay attention to the length of the days. When I start to see an increase in the length of the days is typically when I will kind of get away from the ditch, strictly fishing in the ditches, to starting to target secondary um, kind of structure um, to the bank. Right. Um, and that is kind of when we start getting into the what I start calling, we get out of the pre-pre-spawn into the pre-spawn. Right. But that's not to say that you can't catch fish in the timber or up shot. You can No, you that. can still do but all that. But this is the way you yeah. target it right this now. This is just me personally. Okay. You know, and, and like, I didn't write the book on this. You know, I, I did no, not. Of um, but this is just my experience, the way that I've done it. Um, I, I haven't really had any good teachers – to show me the way when I was younger, you know, I had a couple guys that took me fishing, but we never really, they had, they were set in stone. They done their thing and that was what they did. Right. Um, it wasn't until I got my first ever boat on my own, um, several years ago that I was able to go do this on my own and kind of do what I wanted to do and try to do it the way that I felt like, well, let me try this. Right. And, so you learn from experience. I learned from experience. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what what is the number one mistake before we move into the actual pre spawn? What's the number one mistake someone right now that's going to try to go and fish a ditch? What's the number one mistake they make? They're going to stay too long. And why is that? Um, electronics are a great thing, um, and they are. I use them. I I utilize them just as like anybody else. But since active imaging type sonar has come available pan optics and stuff live target and all that stuff you know whatever people seem to get their their eyes glued to it oh i see them you may see them but if you've got to work your tail off to get just one to buy it you're wasting your time and the reason why i say you're wasting your time is is because you can leave and go somewhere else and pull into another place and make a one cast and then catch more, right? That are actually feeding, because they all they all don't feed at the same time. You know, some of them feed for thirty minutes, some of them feed for two hours. You know, it, it all just kind of depends upon their mood and and, and how they want to how they want to what what the bait does yeah, really. And so you're looking for bait, yeah. But I want to share an experience that actually you and I had that I thought was pretty unique and it was something a little different. We actually went into a creek. Mm -hmm. We were going to do the ditch fishing. Mm -hmm. And we left, mm -hmm. but we left for a different reason. Why was that? There was too much bait. Too much bait. Mm -hmm. Now, in my mindset, I was like, no, the bait's here. And you were explaining, no, too much bait. Tell everybody about that. So even though it, like what you were saying, it doesn't make sense, but there is such thing as too much bait. Uh, too much bait is when you pull into a place and there's fish busting everywhere and there's bait everywhere and when you look down on the graph there are just balls and balls and balls and of bait and we saw balls and balls and balls yeah of bait. And, but terrible. so why do they need to single out and and get my single bait that i'm throwing when all they got to do is basically open their mouth and swim through a ball of bait 
Right. Um, you know, I've had people argue with me that, well, they, you know, they're busting over there. Yeah. Get over there close to them and throw something in the middle of them. They're so keyed in on what they're eating. They're not going to touch your stuff. Right. Because they're so focused because there's millions of those things down there. They don't need to think, well, I think that's, I think that's bait. So I'm going to get it. Right. No, they're so keyed in on it that they're like, ah, you're wasting your time. So you're looking for the fine line between no bait, too much bait, that right. perfect amount right in the middle. Right. That them fish, where you at least have an opportunity. My perfect, to my them. perfect scenario to ditch fish is if I pull into an area and I get in there and I let down, and I get on, I get up on the trolling motor and put the trolling motor down and start starting about forty to thirty five feet, and I ain't seen nothing yet. I don't want to see them yet, but then when I look ahead up there to 20, 15, even shallower, and I see them feeding to where I can't cast to them yet because those fish have corralled a ball of bait that may be the entire size of the length of this table where there's 10,000 individual bait right. uh, in there. A good decent sized little pod. Yes. Kind of. Yes, because that creates competition. That creates competition amongst the spots. So if a bait comes if your bait comes down through there and you throw your underspin or your Kitech or you know, whatever it is, Alabama rig don't matter. When you throw that down through there, they don't just sit there and like just strictly, you know, stay underneath the bait ball. Like they'll go up there and they'll eat on the bait. And then they'll run away over here and hide again because, oh, they'll, they'll come back. They'll come back. And then when they come back again, it'll be easy because they're going to slow down. They're going to feel a little bit safe. And then we'll bust them again. Right. And when I can do that, when or when, not just me, when, when you can do that, you're going you're gonna to multiply your opportunity to catch five real fast right. if you're in a tournament situation. Are largemouth the same way? <sighs> Are you really targeting spots when you ditch fish? I'm mainly targeting spots. Um, I mean, a largemouth on Lanier right now, doing that is a bonus fish mm -hmm. to me. Um, however, the population of the largemouth has gotten, has gotten so much better over the past couple of years, um, you know, uh, that you know, like, like I took Dane on that trip. Well, I caught about a four, four and a half pound largemouth doing that same thing with the ditch digger, and it was a bonus fish. Right. Uh, you know, we were catching spots, but then I caught, caught that one. And, uh, you know, you'll catch some largemouth, but, but, but those wolf packs of those four and five pound spots is what you're looking for. Gotcha. Because those wolf pack four and five pound spots in five minutes, you can have 18, 20 pounds. And if you, then if you get the right, if pack. you get the right, if you get the right, if you pull into the right creek, right ditch, and they're back there eating, yeah, it, it's it's stupid fishing, right? It really is, and that and that's not to say you can't go right now and drop shot, you can't go right now and, and fish a point and all that, but this is how you personally approach Lanier. It's how I personally do okay, it, and, that, and that, that's perfect. I like high, I like high percentage, high success. Yeah, it makes sense because I want to be able to make cast cover water. Um, and then, you know, I mean, bait, bait fish, they move. Right. So I want to emulate something moving. Right. Well, a big old spotted bass is more likely to probably get something moving than me having to sit out here for 20 minutes on this one fish that I've marked on my graph and sit here and play with it. Well, you don't like drop shot anyway, do you? I don't really like it anyway. Not but, that it's not effective, but it's no, just not your No, it style. is effective. Spooning is effective. Demiki fishing is effective. Drop shot is effective. Uh, it, I'm not denying that at all. Um, but it, I just, me personally, I'm looking, I'm looking to go, 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 go. Right. You kind of mentioned to me, you're also looking at, uh, pre, pre spawn fish and rocking wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, what about that? So that dictates into the longer days. Okay. Uh, the longer days as they come, uh, you know, your, your shallow blowdowns, uh, your rocky points, your rocky red clay, rocky banks and stuff, they'll hold heat better. Okay. Um, so your fish that want to get out of that stuff, they want to get out of the ditches and they want to go sit on that stuff like that. Those are the high target areas that I look for. Now, are they are they following the bait up there? Does the bait go up there first or is this just basically the fish saying it's warmer? There are some instances where the bait do go, but the majority of the fish that I catch doing that 
there's not a stitch of bait in sight. Okay. They're going up there because for one reason, Mother Nature's calling. Eggs are ready. They're starting to form. Okay. A female spot or a female largemouth, she's got to take care of her babies as they start to form in her belly. Right. Her womb or whatever right. you want to call right. it. Right, exactly. Yeah. But she's got to take care of them. Mm -hmm. There's things that they have to do to nurture those eggs to when it's time to go, it's time to go. And so they're going to start migrating to the warmer spots yes. in the structure. Yes, yes, they will. Okay. They yeah. will. All right, so this is pretty much all pre-spawn. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of you know time are we looking at till we get to the spawn? How long will this pattern, general pattern last? Is it, it at the middle of February is when they're starting to look, or does it go a little bit farther? It'll go, it'll go farther into it, but – so up the hooch and up the chest tee, there's a window of that first full moon in March that regardless of the water temperature, and I argue with a wall about this, you can't you can't change my mind because I have physically seen it. Uh -huh. And I have physically seen it multiple times. Multiple times. When that first full moon hits in March, the older fish, it's it's time to do it. And they go do it. It don't matter if it's 55 or 65. Just something inside of them. There's something, they are programmed and hardwired to, to know. And I think a lot of it has to do with experience. But they, they have spawned multiple times in their life. Which is why you say older fish. Yes, I say older fish. And that's and, and, and that's one little thing that we're, we're going to get into here in a few minutes on the reason why this happens. Okay. And I think it's because it's hardwired specifically to Lanier for this exact reason and that's because if the clouds moon sun stars and lightning all happen at the right time you will have an early herring spawn okay you will have a you will have a population of the herring that will start spawning early the earliest that i've ever found herring actually physically spawning is the second weekend in march okay the water temperature was 58 degrees that is totally against all biological thing about the herring you know you when can sit here and have a biologist sit here and yeah. say oh the herring have to spawn it has to be upwards in the upper 60s for them to spawn getting up close to 70 degrees now nah, let me let me take you back and let me show you the water temperature at that specific spot up the chesty river was 58.9 degrees or 58.8 degrees okay and they were spawning up there there was striper there were spots and there were large mouth eating them and this is still pre-spawn on the stri on the, the spots. Still pre-spawn for so the spots in the large mouth. They're gorging themselves. It's ringing a dinner bell, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really. I mean, they're they're not going to. That's one of the impacts of the bluebacks in the lake. When they ring their dinner bell, when the blueback says, "Here I am, eat me," mm -hmm. they'll the spots in the large mouth and the striper will totally forget what the heck they're doing, and they'll go to them. And they'll go to them, and they'll stay to them until they go until they're gone. Right. They will stay. Where where do uh, bluebacks normally spawn? What kind of area? So bluebacks will spawn on like blow throughs. Um, you know, anybody who don't know what a blow through is, is like you've got like a little island, and then you have like this little saddle of water that goes up to the other bank, and then it's got a little shallow spot Very up shallow. on top of it, and they'll get up there and they'll spawn. Um, they'll also spawn on some of these long tapered shallow reef, uh, re I say reef poles, these long tapered shallow points. Right. And then in the past couple of years, specifically for the, specifically the past two years, we have this weird green grass type stuff that's starting to grow, um, mid lake up, up a little ways up the chesty and then up the hooch a little ways. Okay. And they, I have found them spawning on that kind of stuff. It can be in the back of a pocket. Uh, those particular heron that I said I seen spawning when the water temperature was in the upper 50s, they were spawning on that grass stuff. I don't know exactly what the exact stuff is, but if you throw a shaky head down there, as soon as you pick up a shaky head, it's in the sludge. Okay. And it's just this gray. I don't know what this is. Is it like mossy kind of? No, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like almost like algae type stuff, but it's not really algae. I don't really know what it is to be right. exact. But I figured out that, um, and a couple of my friends, we've all figured out too, that we all share information with each other, that the reason why the herring get up there is because when the herring sitting there beating on each other and getting their eggs off, 
they fall down and they stick to that stuff really, really, really well. So it's just an, it's just a place for them to for their eggs to stick and hatch. Okay. And then of course the normal life cycle of a blueback heron uh, continues. Right. So is this now this is late pre spawn when mm-hmm. this happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And it generally happens a little later, but you're saying first uh, first full moon in March. Well, that's well. The first full moon in March that happens is when these is when some of these wise large mouth and wise spots will go ahead and start will spawn. Will spawn. And I really and truly believe they get they they get it and they get it out of the way and they get it done and they do their thing because they know what's about to happen. Okay. They All have right. experienced it before. Bass have little bitty brains, but bass follow their stomachs, and every year they I think they remember. Hey, this happened before. This happened before. This happened before. So some of these older fish already go ahead and get it out of the way and get get it done. Okay. Talk a little bit about this first wave of fish. Of course, you got largemouth and spots, mm-hmm. and surely they don't spawn in the same areas or in the same depths. And so how does a largemouth compare to a spot as far as where they spawn? So that first full moon in March, if the water temperature is still up in the upper 50s, uh, mid to upper 50s they'll spawn deeper okay. they'll spawn deeper to where your average angler can't won't see them like they'll spawn where your boat's going over top of them while you're throwing at the bank okay um so this is not the typical bed fish that everybody thinks about that is up there they've made a bed you can see it you can pitch to it right. we're off a little bit yes yeah okay um large mouth included large mouth specifically Okay, because that, that, that goes against a lot yeah. of common thoughts that a largemouth is right up on the bank or right up in shallow water. You can see the bed. Yes. So you're saying they're off. Yeah, yeah. This the, first wave. They're pretty. They're they're pretty bad about spawning underneath docks where you can't even get to them. Right. Um, I've seen some spawning in about six feet, six seven feet of water underneath a dock. Okay. That was in a real real clear spot about. Well, it was near a little hall. Okay. And it was underneath a dock in about right. eight feet of water. You could barely see the bed. And as I sat there and stared at it for about five, ten minutes, finally I seen one swim through the bed. And it was very faint, but you seen the fish swim through the bed. Let me ask you this. Let's just take this first wave, and you're out and you're fishing, you're fishing the tournament or whatever. How do you approach this first wave of fish like that? How are you targeting them? Well, those largemouth like that, they're very, very, very hard to catch. They're extremely difficult to catch. So what I'll do instead is, um, I guess I could give out information, I guess. You can, guess, you can give it out. That's right. This um, is what this is all about. A Carolina rig is, like, awesome. Um, and here's the reason why. The spots will actually spawn on, like, shallow humps. Mm-hmm. Um, those first waivers will spawn on, like, a hump that's, like, 15 feet deep. And you, instead of throwing a wacky rig or shaky head or something up there, you can take a three quarter ounce Carolina rig with like a yum dinger on the back and throw that thing over there and drag it over that hump. And I'm telling you, they will swim 10 feet away to hammer that thing. That's what I was getting ready to go to because you said that we've had this conversation. Yes. Tell everybody a little bit of a difference between the way a bedded large mouth and a bedded spot will will guard their bed and slash attack something. Well, uh, the large mouth, they have that one. They have their bed, and sometimes their bed's as big as a tire. Sometimes their bed is as small as this Coke can, you know, the top of this Coke can. Yeah. Um, but there's one little spot in there where the eggs are, and that is the sweet spot for the large mouth. If you ever won that bed fish or everyone that's messed with bed fish before knows there's this – you can throw on the bed, throw on the bed, throw on the bed, throw on the bed, but until you find this little spot – where either the male or the female don't want that to be. Right. That's that spot where you mentally backlog. Hey, that's where every single one of my casts needs to be. And we're talking largemouth. And we're right talking largemouth. Spots will make a bed, and if something comes above them to the side of them, 15 feet away, one or the other, the male or the female, one of them is going to go kill whatever it is right. that, co- that gets too aggressive. close. Yes, they're a lot more aggressive. Yeah. Um. And that's probably what makes spot fishing when they're spawning so much fun because it doesn't take a whole lot of like accuracy. Right. And you, you know, you can keep your boat off of a spot and just keep casting, keep casting and keep casting until, you know, whatever. Um, you're those fish that spawn on like the humps and stuff. They're very unmolested. 
because you rarely ever see people fishing for them. When you see people fishing for spawning spots, they're always going down like a pea gravel bank or something like that or on a pea gravel point, you know, um, or underneath like a real rocky dock or walkway or something like that. Right. And you've got to throw like a little wacky rig or a Senko or something. And those are the fish that you always hear people talk about. Yeah, I throw it up there and they'll tote it off and you'll set the hook and they bite half the worm off. No, these fish that spawn on these humps, there's no, they bit my worm in half. They've swallowed They've it. They've swallowed it. And don't matter what the clear water is, 17 pound test line with a 17 pound test leader with a big old five out hook, EWG hook. They're going to swallow it anyway. They're going to eat it. And you've got a seven and a half foot rod and a bait caster and heavy line to handle them. You ain't going to be having to worry about breaking off a potential PB spot that's right. off the bed. Right. Yeah, she's getting in the boat. Okay. So, how are you? If you're going out fishing, and let's just say, you know, you've got a few on the bed, you've got a few that's off the bed, some that haven't pushed up yet, uh, how are you targeting fish right now? Because we've moved out of the ditches, mm -hmm. so that ditch bite that you described earlier, you may do that a little bit, but that's not going to be your primary goal right now or no are you, are you, not for me no uh so there's two periods this there's two periods in this time of year that we're talking about here that march first of april type deal there's two little periods where i'm trying to catch a large mouth or two or even more if i'm lucky enough mm -hmm. that's on her way toward the back to go to a bed She's still a little pre-spawned. She's still a little pre-spawned. Yeah, exactly. And my number one tool with those that I personally like to do is spinnerbait. Okay. I'll cover water with spinnerbait. You're still old school. I'm still old school because I've caught a lot of fish doing it. And um, you're one of the few guys I know that actually target largemouth on the near. I try to. You try to, right. <laughs> yeah, I try to do my best to. So you still are, you know, using the older... Mm-hmm. Not out of style techniques, but well, what a, a lot of people don't do anymore. Well, a slow rolled, a slow rolled half ounce spinner bait with a big old skirt and a big old grub on the back of it with two big old blades on it, slow rolled this fast, almost like larding across the bottom. Yeah, a little bit of both. I, I I keep a rule of thumb for me is I want to keep it to where I can't see, I can barely see the flash of my blades. Okay. That's the depth of the. That's how deep I want my spinner bait to be. I can control that depth better with a half ounce spinner bait than I can with a three eight. So we're not burning them. We're not burning them. Okay. We're just barely. You're throwing it up there. Uh, can't say how crucial it is. I mean, I I wear glasses, but I have a pair of sunglasses, polarized sunglasses. I paid a lot of money for, simply so I can see. And I can't stress enough from the beginning of the morning, even though it's low light, putting those things on. Because it'll cut, the, it'll cut the glare, what glare there is, even first thing in the morning at seven o'clock, right? To where you can see the see your little blades, and a lot of people miss these bites because they think they're hung on something, and then by that time, that large mouth is bloated out, and you don't realize that you might have just lost a six seven pound lip, right? So you're not as big on the chatterbait and stuff right now. Or I'll skip docks like with the chatterbait, but. I'm, I'm spinner bait or go home because you know that's the in vogue thing now is yeah the that's jig. that's the in thing is to throw a bladed jig type why, bait. why do you think that is why do you think people have moved away from the spinner bait i think the chatter bait is more versatile because you can't skip a spinner bait underneath a dock or underneath like a tree or a low-hanging branch or something right you can skip chatter bait though but um you know spinner bait fishing you're the kind of spinner bait fishing that i'm doing is I'm doing target spinnerbait fishing. So I, may, so I may go down an entire bank, but, you know, if there's a stump over here and a blowdown over here and there's this one last dock that's back here and then in the very, very, very back of the pocket, um, like the very back where there's no more water for them to go to, I'll throw my spinnerbait around them. And I won't just make one cast and go. Because there can be different angles that that fish. She she could be sitting on this stump, just sitting there. Just she's just sitting there like this, and you bring it right in front of her. And she may not like that. Boat keeps going in. You throw back at that stump again. It may come behind her. Well, it may force her to turn around, and she may not like that even more. Right. 
but then it'll force her to make it a reaction decision and she'll think about it more. Well, then you'll throw up there and I've seen it, I've done it too many times. You'll throw up there, blades disappear and a little bit, you start slow rolling that thing and you feel the slightest little bump. And when you set the hook, she's got it because all she's done is that thing's come right by her. And she's just basically opened her mouth without her really having to move and spinnerbait went sideways into her mouth. Right. Um, and I've seen you do this. We fished together before we went into the back of some creeks. Yeah. And you made sure that each and every one, you took the time to throw a spinnerbait back there. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's still it's it's still a big fish bait. Um, I think one of the well, – I have a really, really good friend who doesn't throw a spinnerbait anymore, and his reasoning behind not throwing a spinnerbait anymore is, uh, is, is a good – it's a good reason. I mean, I, I totally, I totally understand his reasoning behind it. Is because if they inhale an entire spinnerbait, and you set the hook, that arm is still in the way. You follow what I'm yeah, saying? Not, so when you set the hook, you may not be hook. able to get a hook into them, even with the trailer hook. And by the way, never throw a spinnerbait without a trailer hook. Okay. I mean, I always throw it with a trailer hook. I don't ever not throw it without a trailer hook. Do you have a specific brand of trailer? <sighs> I mean, I'm not partial to any. I, it's most. Of, I think what I actually have in my box in my boat right now is all three all Gamagatsus. Okay, the little stinger and, or the little. No, I just, they have the piece of PVC tube and you put the hook okay. down there and then right. you stick the piece of P, PVC tube and through the hook and pass it down. Um, and how, then I, how important is the blades at this time of year? Are you tandem Colorado I always, mix of both. I, I I don't. I don't throw a Colorado much um, on Lanier specifically because just the water just doesn't get as dirty as it really needs to be. More of a nighttime thing on Lanier later on in the year. Yeah, more of, but uh, it, the population of largemouth on other largemouth specific lakes with a Colorado blade is higher, so your success rate is much higher. It takes a special largemouth to eat something with like a number three Colorado blade or number four Colorado blade on there. That's putting out a lot of thump. Right. Um, so I pretty much stay tandem, uh, double willow. Okay. And you throw this all through the spawn or? Yes, I will. Okay. I will, I will do it for the first couple hours in the morning shallow. And then I'll go back and do it again in the afternoon for a little bit. Okay. And the majority of the fish that you catch on a spinner bait, Large mouth, or is it equal with spots? Well, how, how does a spot react to a spinnerbait? When I'm throwing those things, when I'm throwing a spinnerbait like that, I'm not looking for spots. Okay. Um, now, if I'm going to go look for spots, I'm not going to throw a spinnerbait. Okay, so you're targeting the large mouth yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And this is during the pre-spawn, late pre-spawn, early spawn, mm -hmm. through the spawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, my number one bait of choice for targeting shallow spawning spots this time that time of year is a methylate trick worm okay what is it about that great orange color that just drives them crazy i don't know they can't stand it <laughs> they, just, they attack it they, that's they, for sure i mean you'll throw that thing up there and it'll hit the water and the, the water will just boil right. underneath it you know and they got it um so you're throwing it weightless or yeah i'm throwing it weightless and you just you just bring it across with a little twitch and you're just letting it do its little yo-yo thing. yeah i just kind of twitch it kind of like a flute Okay. So, but no spinning rod. Right. Yeah, it's a my rod's a seven three medium action rod, bait casting rod, uh, fifteen pound uh, P line CXX copolymer with a swivel, a heavy duty swivel, because it gives me a little bit extra weight to throw it. A five alt worm hook and a methylate trick worm, and I've got a leader that's probably about that long that coming 12, from 18 the, inches kind coming of from the swivel yeah okay. and i throw it on a bait caster what do you throw your spinner bait on bait caster same thing though same setup uh, i throw my spinner bait on 15 pound fluorocarbon okay and i've got a special rod designed for me by kevin underwood okay. he, he designed the rod for me he done the rod how i wanted it and uh, it's one of a kind What's so special about your rod? Um, it has the tip that's soft enough for me to be able to feel the bites that other people can't always feel. Because um, you'll be amazed at how many people can't feel some of those early pre-spawn pre -spawn spinnerbait bites. Everybody, most people that think about spinnerbait fishing, they're like, they jerk the rod out of your hand when they get it. 
I, I mean, there's sometimes that's what most people would think. Yeah. Big, big, large mouth when they get a spinner bait in pre spawn, they there's no oh, there he is, right? No, nah, he just they ain't got heavy, you know. And then if you feel heavy, you better set the hook, right? And when you set the hook, typically it pulls back a lot harder than a never than a regular fish does, a okay. regular size fish does. Now, 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 will this what you've kind of described? North end, middle, south end. Is this pretty consistent, or are we still up on the north? End? It kind of follows down the lake. So we're going to start on the north end first. Mm-hmm. Those yeah. fish are moving up. And yes. Then as we go through the spawn, mm-hmm. the south end kind of catches up. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of the 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 south end. If you start seeing fish on the bed take up the chattahoochee for example like up in wahoo or little river or something for so we're example talking a little bit north around gainesville yeah city of gainesville yeah north, yeah okay kind of mid chestity arm area if you see some some fish on the bed there um or another good giveaway is if you go in the back of a pocket throwing a chatterbait or a spinnerbait or a methylate trick worm and you catch the ever living snot out of bass this big. <laughs> right. They're back there for one reason because they they've already made beds, and you may not be able to see them. But when a buck bass largemouth, if if you throw it back there, any of those baits, and it gets near a bed, there's this little period for the largemouth where they'll attack anything in sight, specifically right. the bucks will. And uh, that's when you can take like a little kid out there and put on like a super fluke or a methylate trick worm or a chatterbait and tell them to throw it up there and they they just they can't help themselves right. <laughs> but but you'll catch the snot out of them this big you know okay. the little butt bass largemouth what but uh, when i see that happening to finish that question yeah. but when i see that happening typically within four weeks you can go down to about around 369 that area and you'll start seeing those fish doing the exact same thing down there and then it gets on down towards the dam mm-hmm. yeah just kind of a little state mm-hmm. like a couple weeks in it yeah know, at a time one of the big myths and you can dispel that is you can't catch largemouth on the south end of lake lanier yeah that is the biggest fool myth i've ever heard in my life <laughs> And why do you think that is? Why do you think people feel that way? They feel like probably because now largemouth are lazy. They're lazy individuals compared to a spot. They are, yeah, they're fifteen times more lazier than the spotted bass is. Um, but a lot of people are scared to do it in the clear water because they feel like, well, they don't know I'm there, right? So they just don't even worry about it. They just don't even try. So you just think that it's just a lack of fishing yeah, for them. It's just a lack of it. Now I know I got several buddies that do it. Yeah. And everybody's like, "Well, how the heck did they do that?" Well, well they went and done it. Right. You know, I mean, they went and fished for them. Still the same way as you would on the north end of Lanier, though. Pretty much, yeah. That I know one guy. I'm not going to name out what he does. Right, he yeah. has one specific way thing that he does that I know for a fact that only him and his partner are the only ones who are doing it. Yeah. So we don't want to give out that because no, it, it going, will be I'm obvious. Going and he's going, we'll get a phone call. No. But. <laughs> Can you go and throw like the spinner bait like you were talking about? Mm-hmm, absolutely. And, yeah. and go throw the methylate trick worm? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Absolutely. I have had I had an entire tournament in April down on the south end where we couldn't go above Browns Bridge and that Claremont Club. And uh I threw methylate trick worm. They wouldn't touch the spinner bait, but I threw methylate trick worm all day long and I bet we caught twenty five fish. Right, just on the on just the thylate. just on the thylate trip, on the trip south, just on going the on end. the south end, going to the backs all every little. This pocket looks good, right? You know, stuff like that. I mean, you know, at two mile specifically. Right, <laughs> there's a pretty healthy there's a pretty healthy population of fish and of largemouth in Two Mile Creek. But you know, um, a lot of people here lately in there and they're thinking offshore, mm-hmm, deep mm-hmm. spooning, drop shot. Yeah, you know, even there, during that time of year. Yeah, and you're saying no, you, let's I'm get not, up shallow. A I don't bit. fool with it. I don't fool with that. And that goes more. That lends more to your uh, being a power fisherman, mm-hmm. as far as finesse. Yeah, yeah. What about uh? What do you think about what the finesse guys? If somebody's listening to this and they're not, they're not a power fisherman, mm-hmm. they're more of a finesse guy during this late pre-spawn, early spawn. What could they do? Just from your experience and from you know the people that you know. What are some of the techniques? Because they might not be, you know, they might not like those spinnerbait. Are you saying that, you know, is there are there other ways that they possibly could target the same fish you're targeting? Shaky heads and flukes are always deadly okay. in the spring, early spring. They're always deadly. If you're throwing a shaky head, describe the way you work one. 
Uh, I mean, are you a dragger? Are you a hopper? I'll drag it. And I'll shake it some. Most of the time, I drag it. Um, I just like I just I'm not much of a I'm not much of a guy who sits there and does this with it. Little rat tat tat tat. Yeah, I don't I don't really do that. I I kind of I kind of pull it like this, you know, a little bit, and I I'll let the tail of the worm kind of do its thing. Um, it so just looks more natural. A little slower, but yeah. not dead slow. You're not like at a dead stop. No, nah, like I, dead, I don't really dead stick it. Okay. No. Um, now, but, a, but a fluke, a guy, a finesse guy can take a super fluke on a spinning rod with like 10 pound fluorocarbon or something like that and how I rig it however they want to rig it. Don't matter, but um, they can go fish down a rocky bank, throw a super fluke. Any particular color so we can help them guys out? I ain't but one color. And what is that? Pearl white. Pearl white. That's the only color Super Flick there is. <laughs> That's my opinion. Right. I, that's the only one I throw. Um, I do I do got one buddy who throws a bubble gum one in spring. Yeah. Um, he, that, he'll that's throw a pretty a popular gum. color, too, in yeah. the spring. Yeah, he, he'll throw the bubble gum, but, you know, he's, he's pretty bad then. If they're biting a bubble gum fluke, he's pretty bad about them picking up a – crankbait instead yeah what <laughs> about crank what, what about crankbaits during this time because now we're getting into what everybody knows kind of is the rock crawler the spro kind of stuff yeah that kind of stuff time that's, of year for me personally that's more february now well now january pre, through about pre pre spawn yeah. pre spawn yeah yeah i mean i mean i'm not saying that there ain't fish that you can't catch with crankbaits in april because there are mm -hmm. and stuff in like march but i i, I just don't do it right because i'd rather work the places that i'll fish the way i like to fish for those fish that are doing what they're doing that i'm trying to find a crankbait ain't gonna do you no good anyway and why is that i you just it's too shallow okay so you're still kind of targeting the ones that are off a little bit yeah okay yeah there's just too the crankbait you mean throwing a crankbait up on the bank in two foot of water, but one that goes down like a rock crawler, it's it don't you don't exactly have very good success doing that. Okay, um, right, then that's fine. It's hard to it, you'll hang it up more than you do anything. Okay, and a rock crawler is pretty pretty hangless. It's it's probably one of the best non hanging baits I've ever. I mean, thrown. you do throw one. Oh yeah, yeah, you oh, do yeah. throw one, but at this time you're not mm -hmm. using it as much. No, I'm not well, using it. When we're as talking much. late pre spawn. Yeah. Right now it's pretty good. Right now it's good. Um, when the water temperature starts to get back, it's, it's falling now, you know, in the upper 40s. When the water temperature crawls back up into the low 50s again, I, right. I throw it. Right. I'll throw it on rocky points and rocky secondary points going in the backs of creeks and stuff like that. Right. Um, Before we get into the second, because you know, we've kind of just, you said it's kind of two parts of the spawn, mm -hmm. and we kind of talked about the early fish moving up. Mm -hmm. uh, before I get into the... Uh, later part of the spawn mm -hmm. what about jerk baits a lot of guys like to throw jerk baits in cold water and stuff what about you do you consider that a power technique yeah it, it is a power fishing technique um i i utilize the jerk bait a little bit different than some people do okay um i i've used it more ditch fishing yeah, you uh, mentioned it earlier. Anything. We just re didn't really harp on it. Yeah, and and, and this is like, like for right now, I throw the jerk bait down the middle of a creek, twitch it down the middle of a creek. But you don't really concentrate boat. throwing it all day long at mm -mm, times. Mm -mm, not really, unless the conditions dictate for it. Then I will keep a jerk bait in my hand. And what are those conditions? Uh, windy, sunny day. Okay, so windy, sunny, mm -hmm. and that's better than what? That's. As far as I'm gonna throw a jerk bait, why? Why is it windy and sunny? I feel like I can. Me personally, I feel like when it's like that, I feel like I can get bit better on that this time of year rather than a spinner bait. Okay. Um, but it has to be that day, that type of day, or yeah, for me, right? For me personally, yeah. Do you have a special way that you work your jerk bait? Not really. So you're not one I of those just, guys. I kind of let, go... let the fish tell me. I start with like a twit. I, I start with like a jerk, jerk jerk Talk. jerk and then i'll let the fish tell me kind of whether you need to slow it down yeah. or speed it up mm -hmm. kind of like pretty that. much that's my rule of thumb which that should be a rule of thumb for anybody with a jerk bait let the fish tell you what cadence they want anyway because they'll tell you what cadence they want have if you the ever fish got, are there have you ever gotten you. that situation where it's like jerk jerk go eat a sandwich jerk jerk because some of them guys do it but now you're a power guy so i don't see that being 
you being patient enough to do that? It's hard for me to do it, but about six years ago, we had to jerk, 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 and let it sit there for about 10. And if one would get it, when you would go to jerk again, when you went to go jerk, it pulled back. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Because they just basically had come up and they just like grabbed it in their mouth. Now, this was like 39, or th- oh, it was about 39 degree water temperature. So really cold. It was up on Chatoog. Okay. Yeah. It yeah. was very cold. Which, that's, that's a pretty clear lake, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I but just, we had to do that like all day because they wouldn't even touch a jig. Yeah. And I haven't even gotten it. And for those that know Ryan around the uh, Lake Lanier, North Georgia area, that's, you know, one of your specialties as far as even making them and, and using them. Um, mm-hmm. Before we go any farther, how about right now, jig fishing now up until the spawn? Do it. What are we targeting? <laughs> uh, rock. Okay. Timber. Um, Do you use it in the ditches? Y- yeah, you can use it in the ditches. Um, specifically, when they get on something specific, uh, goes back to that little bend that we're talking about. So you're still um, you're, you're still targeting that one little area as, mm-hmm. as opposed to just blind casting it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's still got to be. You still got to know what you're throwing it at. Yeah. Um, so when you're jig fishing, you're still structure oriented. Mm-hmm. I am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I don't. I don't sit there and soak it too long. You give me about five, ten minutes throwing a jig, and if I don't get bit pretty quick, I I, I go, I go on. Okay. Um, I, I just that's just me. I, I just know the 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 bottom line. If anybody learns anything from this, is that Lake Lanier is one of the handful of lakes in the entire country. That at any given time, any present situation, any day, somewhere, multiple different locations on the lake, the the bass are eating hooks with sinkers. Right. I, I mean, that's really the only way to describe it. Right. I, they're they're eating somewhere. They're eating. Right. Yeah. And, and there are some lakes where it does go through just this dead period where they just don't want to eat. But Lanier. There's never, I don't, my my opinion, there is never not a situation where somewhere, somewhere on the lake, their fish, the spots and stuff are eating. Which kind of goes to your uh, personality of running gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I noticed, you know, in our experience, you're moving. Mm-hmm. You're moving. So it's a little bit different than a lot of lakes where, and we've heard, we've heard people on, on multiple occasions talk about going up, using their you know, or they'll approach a brush pile, two, three casts, nothing. Mm-hmm. We're going. We're packing I do that. up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're a mover. Yeah, yeah. And so, why not sit there and work a area? I personally just don't want to waste my time doing it, especially I, in a tournament I, situation. I I'm a wide open fisherman, uh-huh. and I'm wide open, but I'm also lazy. <laughs> why? I want fish that I can throw something out there, work it, reel it, whatever. And they're gonna eat it. They're going to eat it. They're going to eat it. If not, I'm going to go and find something that are going to want to eat it. Right. Um, that's just me personally. Yeah, I mean, I've got my tail kicked by guys who sit there and soak a spot by for six hours. It ain't my cup of tea. It just ain't. So you're not saying it don't work. It's I'm just not saying not it don't me. work. It's just not me. Okay. I, I, it's I to- not me. I totally get it. All right. So let's uh, let's kind of progress forward. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about wave two of the spawn. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what is different about say the younger you know you kind of mentioned the older bass Mm -hmm. have moved up to spawn first Mm -hmm. and that's just your opinion you said you'd argue with people about it but Mm -hmm. let's talk about wave two wave two is where you've got when you go in the back of a creek at 11 o'clock in the morning and there's like a bed here a bed there a bed there a bed there and there's a little shallower mm -hmm, they're shallower you can see them spots and large mouth spots and large mouth yeah Okay, do you target them or fish for them any different than you do the early wave? The ones that are strictly on the bed, yeah, I be, I'll, I'll bed fish for them. More sight fishing. More sight that. fishing, okay. yeah. Um, and so your personal opinion on bed fishing, I know there, there's two schools of thought. Well, there's three. There's those that say, I'm not doing it for whatever reason, right. whether it be moral or whatever. There's some that, you know, especially in terms, they're going to do it, and then, you know, we got those of us that kind of fall in between either way. How about you specifically? 
On Hartwell, Clark Hill, Russell, Burton, Chattoog, Lakes like that, West Point, Oconee, Sinclair, I'll jerk everyone off I can find. I will. Lanier, I don't, if I jerk one off the bed, I, I typically, unless it's just this massive, large mouth, I, I'll put it back. Okay. I don't really try to look for them either, too. And the reason why is because Lanier's my home lake, and I need those fish to spawn and just continue to spawn generations for my summer bite. So it's just a, I don't want to say selfish, but. It is, you can say it's yeah. selfish. It is selfish. It is me being selfish. Yeah. Well, at least you're honest. Yeah. You know. I just don't want to do it. Now, I'm not going to come up to you in a tournament and be like, you shouldn't have jerked that fish off the bed. Nah, that's not my business. Right. You know, you're trying to win some money. You're yeah. trying to have a good show. And, but me personally, no, nah, I ain't going to do it, really. Okay. I'll go out there and go practice, and I'll go, you know, I'll go jerk one. You know, I can take anybody to the lake and show them how to sight fish. And they, by the end of that day, they will know how to do it. Right. So I, I keep the mentality, and you can call it arrogant. I keep the mentality that there ain't there ain't a bad fish I can't catch. You can just call it confidence. Well, I guess. So right. whatever, if you want to call it confidence, it don't matter. There ain't a bad fish I can't catch. But? I just don't focus on it. Okay. So if you're not focusing during this late second wave of pre-spawn, you're not focusing on it, how are you targeting fish? What are you trying to catch then? Those that have already spawned? Yes. And how are you doing it? Top water. So by this time, those that have spawned and you say wave one, they've already done their business. Mm-hmm. The females have moved back or into their going in. I guess they're progressing into their summer mm-hmm. type patterns and mm-hmm. stuff. And so, top water is going to be we're moving it. back out to those long taper points and reef poles and blow through still looking for that hair and shad spawn stuff going on. Okay, mm-hmm. do you ever throw swim jigs or anything like that? I'll throw a swim jig. Or- really around the shad spawn more than the herring spawn okay um i've i used to be like probably a lot of people when i throw a fluke but i got sick and tired of twitching the fluke oh my god there was a five pound spot just bowled all over my fluke in slow motion well that's all it was right just a bull yeah um i found out this past year uh that a swim jig will get more bites because they seem to, they seem to swallow the bait. They attack it they, too. Yeah. yeah. And fifteen pound test line, seven three medium heavy rod, whack on them yeah. when they bite. You, you're jerking the snot out of them. Do you just reel or do you do that Alabama shake stuff? No, I don't Alabama shake. And for those of you that don't know, that's just holding your rod tip high while you're reeling mm-hmm. and giving it a shake. I pretty much throw it out there, hit the water count to about two because i pretty much only throw a half ounce on lanier mm-hmm. so i count to about two and then i basically just do this now do you take your trailer and turn it up or you leave it flat well i i pretty much throw the swimming senko okay right so i got a little paddle tail basically on the back okay so you're not using the double tail mm-hmm. using more of the fish type Mm-mm. no i the double tail type deals and i'll turn them on their side but the double tail the double tail type deals i'll, I'll stick to that to oconee okay you know someplace like that down there where it's just just where you kind of have to you almost have to alabama shake down on oconee why because it's so shallow. Oh, just to keep <laughs> yeah, it up. Okay. Yeah, you have to keep it picked up, you know, while you're reeling it, you know. So is that the purpose of the Alabama shake? You think it's not to put more action in the well, I mean, it puts action on it, but they, they don't. I've caught more on a swim jig with it higher up in the water column than it banging along the bottom. Okay. Um. So, and they'll they'll chase the thing. They'll annihilate the thing. All you'll see is a dang flash and they I got that swim jig. Let me ask you this question because it just popped into my mind while you were describing that. If you're wanting to keep it up, keep a jig, a swim jig up, and you're wanting that action, why wouldn't somebody just use a bladed jig and reel it faster instead of having to do all that work with a swim jig? What's the difference? You can call me crazy if you want to, but there are some instances where they just don't want that blade. Oh, so you think the blade is what? The yeah, difference? there's some instances where that thing just puts out too much. Too much action. Yeah, it's just too much vibration. 
Okay. It's just way too much. And you think that's a turnoff to sometimes? I think sometimes it is a turnoff. Okay. But, that's, but that's a personal opinion of mine. Uh, and, you know, like I said earlier, it's it's I, it's not in the book of me. It's right. just my – it's in the book of my personal experience. Right. So, you know, it's uh, – uh, When is the best time to throw a chatterbait? I prefer to throw a chatterbait in, around, gra- around grass lakes and stuff like that. So you can catch fish on one near with them, but yeah. it's not the best choice. And it's the, it's for me. It's not the best choice. Okay, I don't love it. I know there's some guys I love it to death. Um, my experience with the chatterbait on the near is you go out there and I say I'm gonna go throw a chatterbait, and I throw a chatterbait, and I waylay on them on a chatterbait, and then the very next week or something like that, go throw a chatterbait again. They won't sniff it, and then buddy in the back of the boat puts a chatterbait down, picks up a spinnerbait. Makes about five cats with spinner bait. There's one. Right. I got it. So it's yeah, not consistent. Going in the rod locker. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you know. It's not it's consistent. Just, yeah, it's just not consistent enough okay. for me. All right, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, I, There is a nice, there's a couple guys, and I'm not going to name no names. There's a couple guys who buys a man jackhammers and rip the skirts off of them and put Kitex on the back of them, and that is how they jack, they, that is what they chatter bait. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Little tip. A little tip. 28 I ain't going to name no names. 283338. 33. 33 Kitek. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any particular colors? No. I don't can't can't give it up. If you were doing it, how about this? If you were taking a bladed jig chatter bait and you were putting a 33 Kitek, what would you put on it? I'm going to do uh, a green pumpkin head with a black blade and I'm going to put like a green pumpkin type swimming trailer on the back like a Kitek. Are we mimicking more of the bluegill? Blue gill. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. That's just me. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Now, if you go to Seminole or Eufaula or Oconee or Sinclair, you can bet your bottom dollar if you go look at the deck of my boat in April or May. I mean, not April or May. Um, April or March. Um, I got one lit on deck. Chatterbait or one of those that you just mm-hmm. described. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's yeah. a, Hey, that's a good tip. Somebody needs to try that out. How long does the spawn normally last on Lanier? What, what, what are we talking about periods of from early March to when? You'll start seeing – you'll see them through May on into the end of May. So it's just waves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, my thing with it is my general rule of thumb with the spawn every year on Lanier is there's like three waves. Okay. There's the, there's the, there's the early wave that we talked about already. Mm-hmm. There's the – Bolt population wave, which happens typically around that full moon in April. Okay. And then there's another population of them that spawn in that full moon in May. Okay. So we got so small percentage in March, mm-hmm. the majority in April, mm-hmm. and then a small percentage in May. Yeah. Generally speaking. Generally speaking. Yeah. I, I have one year, probably about four or five years ago, I saw more in May than I did in April. Yeah. And then in June, I saw a few in June, which kind of shocked me. Those up there in like 77 degree water spawning in like a foot of water. But I don't think those spawns are very successful that happen that time of year. Now, those that are later, is that more towards the south end of the lake? Is the north end yeah. done? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like it's progressing down towards the south, mm-hmm. but the later in the year, it's more south. Mm-hmm. So up north on Lanier, which is a pretty big lake, mm-hmm. that's already done. Yeah. Okay, which is going to lead us into... A little section on the post spawn because Mm -hmm. you basically have just said March through May is kind of the spawn and all that like that. So real quick, uh, and I've got some more, a couple more questions for the earlier stuff. But post spawn, Mm -hmm. you know you're on a post spawn pattern. Mm -hmm. Top water, Mm -hmm. and what is about top water on Lake Lanier that is so much different than everywhere else? Catch more fish, catch bigger fish. Okay. The quantities of them are the quantity and the quality is extreme on Lanier specifically. Now, top water largemouth has got to be different than top water spots as mm. far as where you're locating them. Not necessarily. So, when everybody that knows about Lanier, they know about offshore. You hear offshore, offshore, mm. offshore. Yeah. Largemouth out there offshore? They're getting there. Oh, so they're, they're kind of they're, they're coming get, back. They're getting there. Mm hmm. Uh, and the ABA back in September, uh, big fish for the tournament was a largemouth that got caught in schooler, schoolers over really? a brush pile. Over brush pile. Mm-hmm. And on why the, do you think that is? On the south end of the lake. Why do you think that is? 
they've tasted the herring. So you think just Mother Nature is mm-hmm. kind of okay? These fish are adapting to herring. Herring, herring are like uh, herring are like Mountain Dew. Okay, this is as best as I can kind of describe it to people watching that may not know understand herring. Herring are like Mountain Dew. You crack open a Mountain Dew and you taste that thing. You're able to take a big sip of that thing when you're hot. Right? Am I right or am I wrong? You're right. You're right. Um, you know, and it feels good going down it is satisfying um them eating herring is i think is like a, a good analogy to throw with them okay it's satisfying they're full of protein man they're, they're just they're just they they eat they 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 digest different right they put on the muscle they put on the weight but it's kind of going against what you said mm-hmm. earlier that largemouth are lazy. Mm-hmm. So they've got to adapt a little bit to be herring. Well, if you right? want to understand what herring really do to largemouth, you need to make a trip to Lake Murray in South Carolina. And why is that? Because it's strictly largemouth in that lake. There are no spotted bass in Murray. But it has bluebacks. But it has blueback herring in it. And how do they act differently? Uh, they act like spots. <laughs> that Well, they act like striper. Right. Yeah. They, they, they lose their mind. It's a pretty. That's pretty. That's pretty good to think because even on uh, we have a local reservoir here, mm-hmm. uh, Latham, mm-hmm. that has largemouth and spots, has somebody has put bluebacks in it, but it has a healthy population of threadfin. Mm-hmm. They school. Mm-hmm. It fishes like very similar to a small Lake Lanier, but you can catch largemouth out mm-hmm. in those schools, mm-hmm. and you think it's because of the bait. The mm-hmm. bait has made certain largemouth. Yeah. Kind of adapt. I think once they, it's like I said, look at the Mountain Dew thing. Once you taste it, it's hard to get away from it. I think anybody won't argue that. Once you taste the Mountain Dew, it's hard to, it's hard to put them down. It is. It, it, I guess you could say it to a certain extent with other different kind of drinks. I guess some people have to have their morning coffee. Right. You know, it's the same way. Like you got to have it. I think they got to have it too. And once so the, they taste it. And so that's the way you're going to approach the post spawn. You're going to go top water, top water, top water, mm-hmm. and then you might try something else. But top water is number one. Very rarely will I try anything else. Okay. May through September, I don't really do much else. It's top water. It's strictly top water and swim baits. Okay, give me your top three top water baits for Lake Lanier because this is pretty much the conversation for today. Number one, and this is in terms of the amount of fish that I've caught on them. Number one will be a Lucky Craft Gunfish. Okay. Be number one. Number two will be a Chug Bug. Okay. Not a Chug Bug Junior. Not the massive Chug Bug. The one that weighs three eighths of an ounce. Okay. Um, and uh, a Sabil, uh, okay. or now a Berkeley Magic Swimmer. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. You're a Magic Swimmer. Yeah. Okay, and what is it about those three baits that separates them from everything else? Um, so the the gunfish spits water and walks, and you can reel it and work it as fast as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's no rule to it. You're trying to drive the fish insane to attack the bait, to eat the bait. Um, a chug bug has this massive drawing power out there um, that'll draw the fish to them from way out of the way um and then a sabil it just imitates a herring the way a herring swims it just it so fast you can you know you just reel it you can reel it on top of the surface like this you know and then kill it twitch it and then let it sink for a second and then reel it some more so using the speed mm-hmm. of, the, of that yeah and that's your pretty much your three primaries that's my three primaries for offshore yeah Okay, and that's for spots and large mouth, but pretty much you're going to catch more spots. You're going to catch there. majority spots and striper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Many a man has lost his bill yeah. on, on, on yeah. near to stripers. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've kind of covered the three the three areas. Uh, for somebody that's going to be listening to this in the ne- in the very near future, okay, we're mid-January, and let's, let's, let's come back. Let's come back full circle. What is Ryan going to be doing, or what is he going to recommend to anyone listening to this? What are we going to Lanier to do? How are we going to catch them right now? So that that's fresh in somebody's mind. I'll be looking for fish in the ditches. Okay. Um, and then uh, I'll have a crankbait, like a rock crawler. I'll keep that. For the very near future, the, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll keep that. Um, can't go wrong with shaky head or jig, personal preference. 
um, and uh, a jerk bait when it gets windy. Um, and then once the days start getting longer here, that's when my spinner bait right. bite that I start looking for starts happening. Okay. Um, but you won't be able to go wrong with a Kitek on a ditch digger or a underspin, um, a jerk bait, a rock crawler, or a shaky head. Okay. All right. And so we're going to end with this. What is the number one mistake? somebody could make over the next month month and a half on Lake Lanier that's going to really diminish their chances to be successful probably my advice would be you're staring too long into your electronics and why is that just because just because they're there doesn't mean that you're definitely going to oh they're there I'm going to catch them right and sometimes they just they don't want to buy. Um, so you think it starts playing mental mind games? A with very, somebody? very, very good example for any of you guys watching. And don't take long, but if you want to see where I get this from and why I say this, in 2015, Takahiro Omori should have won the Bassmaster Classic up on Hartwell. Hartwell Lanier, very similar. More population largemouth on Hartwell than there are on Lanier. But they fish very similar because of the bluebacks. Mm -hmm. And they're laid out a lot the same. Two major rivers, a mid-lake area, and a big south end. Takahiro should have won the Classic. But on day three, day two, 20 pounds, large mouth and spots, drop shot. Staring at his electronics. Had a great day. No denying that. Sunday, he stared at his electronics too long. They just and he hitting. had 13 pounds. When yeah. he should, he sat there. If you go back and watch it, go back and watch it. Takahiro Mori soaked this one particular area for the entire classic. And he says at 1 o'clock on Sunday, I need to go do something different, but I just don't not going to. <laughs> he says that he admits it on camera. And... I think some people get so caught up in doing what they're doing. Right. And he's sitting there. He's a professional fisherman. He has won a Bassmaster Classic already. He has won numerous other Bassmaster Open events, and he is a multiple-time Elite Series champion. He can fish better than all of us can combined Right. in this room. And he sits there and admits he needs to go do something different. But he's so consumed with his electronics fishing that way at that time. Because, he, well, I caught him yesterday doing this. Right. So it should work today. Yes. When in reality, if he would have went and done something different, which the winner of that classic was Casey Ashley, and he threw basically a fish head spin in ditches all day long, and he won. I got you. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's, And that is one of the reasons why I – Stay moving. I got it. Makes sense. Well, Ryan, let me tell you what. I appreciate you taking the time um, just to kind of give your view mm -hmm. and your kind of uh, way of approaching Lake Lanier. Mm -hmm. I know that you have mentioned there are others that do it differently, but this is your pattern. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. And you, you're pretty successful with it. It's like that. So I try to be. <laughs> you try to be. So thank you for telling everybody that. I kind of hi I highly recommend giving it a shot. You know, mm -hmm. even if you're a finesse guy, give this power uh, fishing a shot. And, uh, man, I just appreciate you coming on and doing it. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you right. having me. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks. Guys, we appreciate you joining us for this episode of the Fish North Georgia podcast. Make sure you check us out on any of your podcast platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and hit that icon so you'll be notified of any future content. Every Thursday night, check us out on the live well on YouTube where we have a live show where you can comment in the section so we can interact with you personally. Make sure you give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram at Fish North Georgia, and we'll see you later.